The search term, Brian Birch Catholic Vote, is trending on Google. Do you know why? Hi, this is Catholic Resources and in a moment we shall explain the real reason Brian Birch of Catholic Vote has been seeing a surge in searches on Google. We are certain that this is because faithful American Catholics are fed up with the public bickering among our bishops and priests that show their utter division on who to vote in as president in November 2020. Catholic Vote is known as a magisterium faithful website, so Catholics are looking for objective analysis rather than heated opinions from our shepherds. Remember to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get more videos on Catholic topics the moment we release them. Although Catholic Vote is loyal to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it doesn't empower you to arrive at a decision without the emotions. Most of their content is opinionated and leads you to a certain position. We recommend the book just published by Ascension Press, Clear Conscience, A Catholic Guide to Voting. Why every Catholic should read this book. As Americans and Catholics, we are blessed with a great political heritage. We take for granted that all human beings have dignity and worth. We believe that torture, enslavement, and oppression are unacceptable. We accept that even the lowliest among us have rights, and that it is immoral to violate those rights. We even believe that violations of such rights should be illegal. We may think these ideas are obvious or even cliché. Actually, they are brilliant. Throughout world history, and even in some places today, relatively few nations have known and embraced these principles and put them into practice. Sadly, when it comes to world politics, abuse and corruption are more the norm than the exception, a fact that should make us see our own political order as all the more precious. What is more, our political heritage has been hard won. It has been carefully distilled by ingenious, courageous, and holy people over the course of millennia. Think of our political heritage as a family heirloom, lovingly maintained by countless generations of our forebears. They polished it, kept it safe, and defended it from burglars. Many sacrificed their lives for it to ensure that we would possess it. It is now up to us to take ownership of this legacy, and hand it down intact to future generations. A first step is simply to learn and understand the political legacy we enjoy today. This book does not tell you who to vote for or what position to take on each complex political issue that candidates and pundits debate every election season. And as it happens, neither does the Catholic Church. As you will discover in the following chapters, the Church is not a political party, and its teachings are not a political platform. The Church has authority in political matters, but only when politics invades its turf. That turf is in the realm of the eternal. The unchanging truths about the dignity of mankind and the meaning of human life. Taking responsibility for our politics. Outside of those teachings, the Catholic Church leaves us free to discern what is best in our political environment and even to arrive at diverse political conclusions on all but just a few immutable, life, issues. This is why no Catholic priest or bishop can order us to do or not to do anything based on our convictions about certain political issues, such as how best to address climate change. This is also why Catholics do not need permission from our spiritual leaders before we take action to defend our religious liberty when we feel it is under threat. The Church's leaders can offer opinions on such specific political questions, of course, but their authority on such issues lies in the validity of their reasoned arguments, just like any other Catholic. Otherwise, no community initiative on many important issues could be undertaken without Catholics first obtaining permission from their pastor or bishop of each diocese. The Catechism of the Catholic Church CCC 2442, however, is clear in this regard. It is not the role of the pastors of the Church to intervene directly in the political structuring and organization of social life. This task is part of the vocation of the lay faithful, acting on their own initiative with their fellow citizens. Social action can assume various concrete forms. It should always have the common good in view and be in conformity with the message of the gospel and the teaching of the church. It is the role of the laity to animate temporal realities with Christian commitment, by which they show that they are witnesses and agents of peace and justice. As any priest will tell you, the Church needs Catholics, in the pews, to act independently in the realm of politics. In practical terms, given the hierarchical nature of the Church, 
much of the necessary agility to act with urgency when needed would be lost if Catholics needed to obtain clerical permission before acting as they prudentially discern they should in the political sphere. As the Catechism CCC 900 states, since, like all the faithful, lay Christians are entrusted by God with the apostolate by virtue of their baptism and confirmation, they have the right and duty, individually or grouped in associations, to work so that the divine message of salvation may be known and accepted by all men throughout the earth. Their activity in ecclesial communities is so necessary that, for the most part, the apostolate of the pastors cannot be fully effective without it. Acting with a clear conscience. The responsibility of Catholics, then, regarding political life is certainly great. By the same token, though, taking a direct hand in the political structuring and organization of social life, means that we had better know what we are doing. After all, the policies we promote and the candidates for whom we vote can have enormous effects in the lives of many. Going about politics haphazardly would amount to being careless with our neighbors' lives. We need to approach politics and voting with a clear conscience. The only way to do this is by obtaining a clear understanding of the unwavering truths the Christian faith teaches about human beings and society. In Chapter 1, we will discuss the Church's embrace of the best of Greco-Roman political thought. We will see that human reason is a legitimate and God-given means of discovering what is best for us and our neighbors, and that politics is not some frivolous human invention, rather, it is as natural to us as the loving bond between members of a family. Finally, we will present the true purpose of politics, which is to make us happy. Amazing, but true. In Chapter 2, we will discover how the Church inherited and perfected the political principles of the Old Testament. God's revelation to His chosen people gives us everything human reason has to offer and more. We will see how sin poses a primordial threat to our fulfillment and happiness, which is why God gave us eternal laws to free us. Chapter 3 presents the political miracle of Jesus. The church he founded adopted and Christianized the best of ancient Jewish and Greco-Roman culture and shared it with the entire world. The result? The invention of the notion of inherent human rights, a world in which governments are held accountable for how they treat God's children. Chapter 4 introduces the concept of natural law, which is the law that God wrote into the fabric of all of created reality. We cannot violate the natural law without serious consequences, any more than we can violate the law of gravity by flying out of a second-story window without suffering serious injuries. In this chapter, we will also discuss positivism, the theory that political leaders can ignore natural law whenever they see fit. Positivism, in one form or another, is responsible for some of the worst atrocities in human history, atrocities that highlight the importance of Catholics like you speaking up boldly on behalf of the natural law. In Chapter 5, we see why the Church has always embraced patriotism as a Christian virtue. Patriotism, though, can be twisted into a chauvinistic and unthinking national pride or a cringing obedience to the whims of demagogic leaders. True patriotism is based in nature. Just as we are called to honor our parents and our families, we owe our nation a special honor, because it is our nation. In Chapter 6, we discuss the pitfalls of political power. When human beings have a great deal of power, they have a tendency to abuse it and end up hurting others. Historically, even leaders of the church were overcome by this temptation when they found themselves with temporal and military power over lands and regions. We know that might does not make right. In fact, it is more likely to make us wrong. Chapter 7 presents a thorough analysis of what a government owes its citizens, and what we as citizens owe our government. We have a place in our political environment, and if we abandon our role, we can expect the government to begin to fail or, just as bad, try to take over the role we abdicated. Big government is not equipped to do well what we, our families, and our community are meant to do. On a similar note, Chapter 8 helps us see the moral questions that we, as Christian citizens, must figure out for ourselves. The Church leaves many political issues in the realm of prudential judgment, that is, the realm of personal conscience. This means that we must be all the more serious about thinking clearly and conscientiously about our media consumption, our public witness, and our vote. 
Starting with Chapter 9, we will begin a Catholic, guided tour, of specific political issues, the first being war. Then, in Chapters 10 through 16, we will proceed through a discussion of guns, poverty, immigration, racial injustice, the environment, human life, and human sexuality, and the implications each of these topics has on our political involvement. Click on the link in the description below to check out the book, Clear Conscience, A Catholic Guide to Voting.